Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm delighted to have as my guest, Alex Lowe. He is somebody who really focuses on digital sales evangelism. Uh, he's got a really strong background in professional services, and uh, we're going to have a very lively discussion about the evolution of how we get to customers. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. I'm delighted to uh, to be on here, and I'm 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 looking forward to this one. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you wish for. So, okay, um, could you give sixty seconds on your background, please? Uh, yeah. So uh, I started life out in Mini One Three Two. So those in London know what I mean by that. I then fell into recruitment. Uh, five years at Michael Page International, recruiting sales professionals into the IT and tech sector. Then moved to professional services, so BD at PwC, the accounting firm, got bored of the accountants, moved to a law firm, uh, BLP, where I set up their key client program towards the end of my tenure there, which is seven, eight years ago, possibly longer. Uh, introduced to Sales Navigator and this concept of social selling, so been on Sales Navigator since year dot. Uh, then moved into commercial real estate, led the first ever social selling program globally in the commercial real estate sector, according to LinkedIn. Uh, did half a million net new, built a pipeline of 4.9 million, Brexit happened, lost my job, been consulting back into industry for the last four and a half years, uh, helping organizations with their digital sales transformation, and most recently re, uh, working with Lately, uh, the social media marketing AI platform to help them scale into the enterprise. Excellent. Okay, so you've managed to do estate agency, legal, and accounting, and you're still saying, well, yeah. maybe, we'll, we'll see. Okay, <laughs> So, Alex, tell me, what are the three most important unasked questions in relation to digital sales? How do I measure it? How do I get my people to, to do it? And then who should lead it? Okay, so let's start with how do I measure it? The amount of times I've been asked this question by sales enablement people, which is somewhat concerning, and I always go back to, well, how robust is your CRM process? And by that, I mean attribution in terms of recording activity, but I don't mean going to Salesforce or Dynamics and the salesperson hitting the very first thing they can see in the drop-down menu, cold call, or not adding anything. Do you have a, a menu in your CRM which says this was generated by this email campaign, by cold call, by social, by this blog post, by all the little kind of touch points that, uh, that happen? And if you don't, then fundamentally, you can't prove anything works because you're not then recording how your pipeline is being is being generated. And normally I get a pause and I get a reflection and they go, yeah, we're not doing that. Right. Well, this then speaks to the third in the room, um, which is the total lack of CRM hygiene. Uh, well over 80% of data in most CRMs is either useless or has faded through um, inaction, inactivity or irrelevance. And so what flabbergast me is how many organizations are making and basing their decisions on what is effectively a work of fiction and hope, also known as a forecast. And they're trying to make investment decisions for their future on the basis of data that is less than 20% accurate. Yeah, and in the professional service world, it's even worse because the use of CRM systems are even <laughs> are, are, are non-existent to be us being generous with them. And oh, come on, Excel is a wonderful tool. In, indeed, and you can slice and dice the numbers how you how you want to make it fit your uh, fit your narrative when it comes to your uh, your profitability conversations with your managing partner and your CFO. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, and the second question was: How do I get my people to do it? How do we get our people to do it? Okay, again, love your take on this? It comes back to what's in it for me. So when I work with organizations, you have to get down to the granular individual person. And whether this is a lawyer, accountant, a realtor, or even a, a, a salesperson, if that individual does not understand what's in it for me personally, how is this going to fundamentally help me achieve my goals, which is making money primarily at the end of the, the day, hitting, hitting that number, they're not going to do it. And, and the challenge with digital sales, social selling, modern selling, whatever you want to call it, it's just sales and marketing in the 21st century, let's get real, is that typically the social side is feels like a marketing push. So it feels like to the employee, this is corporate telling me to push this bland marketing message into my network who have got no interest in what 
the market have got to say because they see their social network almost as their private address book. So it, it's mine. It's not the businesses. Therefore, they're not interested in terms of what the business has got to say. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. But that also rings true, and I've been on the receiving end of this, of kind of any broader technology in, you know, implementation or, or, or adoption. So we're rolling out a new CRM system. Great. W what's in it for me? Why should I change moving from my spreadsheet, which works perfectly well for me, to do something which feels like it's the corporate machine leveraging it from a management numbers to your earlier point, um, Marcus, around they just want to report up a bunch of meaningless numbers to their make decisions, and it's for the corporate rather than me, the, the, the individual. And, and that's where I usually get the light bulb moments. It's the, oh, now I understand how this can benefit me you know, from a selfish perspective, that then they start to understand how that then ties back into why they are then being asked or maybe told to then do this, this thing in the digital world. This, what you've just talked about unpacks a whole load of really excruciatingly stupid things that go on. The, the first thing is that, according to HubSpot, salespeople who are strong social sellers have a 70% higher probability of hitting or exceeding quota, whereas those who don't typically come in at around 40% of mm -hmm. quota. Now, they have historically been very strong in the SME space, so it may vary. Those numbers may vary. However, uh, what we also see is it's indicative that management is not spending anywhere near enough time talking to their individual salespeople or BD people or SDRs to understand what their personal motivations are. Mm -hmm. Because if they did, then that would allow them to frame why social selling, good CRM hygiene actually serves the individual. And then what we end up with is this plethora of or this um, waste in terms of time, effort, and so on, where people are attached and tied to old traditional ways and habitual ways of doing things. And they lack the imagination or, um, you know, the, in your phraseology, the art of the possible in terms of what can be done if they were to adopt and embrace social selling, AI, CRM, automation. And they would much rather work dumber and harder instead of smarter and be significantly more productive and take home more money and suffer less of the grind. So what is it about human beings that makes us so bloody stupid? <laughs> I mean, I'm mean, having come from a, a recruitment background. Um, <laughs> well, I do too. <laughs> selling humans is the worst possible thing on, on the thing to do because they're the most fickle creatures in, in the world. And, you know, Christ, the times before we had kind of mobile devices and, you know, email 24-7, the dread of going into work on a Monday morning and, you know, wake, firing up your, your computer to see which candidate hadn't started or which candidate had failed after three months. Therefore, that meant your commission was always th three months behind the, behind the, the thing. H humans are, we're emotional creatures. It's it, all the research out there in terms of, yes, emotion is part of the process in terms of what we do. The last 18 months has just ripped up the rule book in terms of around uh, all of this. And, you know, people are people. I think what's been interesting that I've noticed certainly online is that we're starting to see the more human aspects come out, that people have good days, bad days, they have shit happening in their lives at, uh, at home. Whether we like it or not, that gets brought to, brought to work. And if management aren't kind of under, understanding that and, and working with that, I'm not saying going down the whole woke, fluffy kind of side of, side of things, because a job needs to be, needs to be, but it also has to understand that there needs to be some flexibility around this. And it's some interesting conversations I've been having with Justin Michael and Patrick Joyce around how if they would start all over again, they'd actually do away with the SDR, AE, marketing construct completely and almost create pods. So here is your, here's your expert cold caller, here's your expert content creator, here's your expert closer, your expert numbers person and expert person on AI. 
that's your number that you have to go and hit at the end of the year. Go do it. However you want to get to that number is entirely up to you. But you figure out as your little kind of pod, go and do that thing. And I think that's a really fascinating way of um, looking at it, trying to create that collegiate team environment that we're all in it together. And it's kind of what Michael Page did almost well around how we were commissioned, because you were commissioned as individuals, but the team had to hit its number before anybody else. So even if I hit my number, if the team didn't hit the number, that wouldn't necessarily trigger my personal commission. So it meant that we had to work together as a unit to bring everybody along the journey and stop doing things like we used to call top drawing candidates. So imagine you came into my my uh, my inbox and Marcus was the perfect candidate for me, but I didn't have the right necessarily role. But my mate Ross, who was sitting next to me, may have had the perfect role for Marcus. I'd be like, fuck it, I'm not going to give it to Ross because I want to make the commission out of Marcus, not Ross. Well, in order to counter that, it was, well, if I then gave Marcus to Ross and that helped Ross and the team make its number, then we actually all move forward to, together. So it's, and the other thing, there's also this, and I believe that probably this is going to be, this is changing, but then you see today on Wall Street Journal that the big titans of industry are forcing people back into the office. At the minute you cross that corporate threshold, there seems to be a switch in the head that you're now just almost the machine in the machine rather than a a person. And I do believe some of that needs to, to change. And Christ, you see the research out there in terms of the churn rate of salespeople is ridiculous. The churn rate of CROs is ridiculous because guess what? The way that you did things 20 years ago probably isn't working today. <laughs> in the US in April, 4 million people resigned their roles. Now, that's around one and a half, two percent of the working population. And it looks like that trend is going to continue. Something like 41% of employees in the developed world are expected to leave their company this year. Now, if you are not paying attention to the human side, then that's going to be a real problem. Uh, we're also seeing at the other end with large organizations that recruited lots of very experienced engineers or who have now become very experienced engineers who've got great superannuity on their pensions and they're all going to be retiring about the same time. And this then opens up a whole question around forward planning, around knowledge loss and knowledge capture. And this is why I think many organizations really have to get better at using technology in partnership with human beings. Yeah. And this is where I, I see so many Luddites out in the sales world who still think that you know the only thing they can do is pick up the phone. Then you've got the other school of thought, which is equally idiotic, which is that cold calling doesn't work. We know that you have to meet your prospects where they are, not where you want, want them to be. And if you look at the success and effectiveness of people like Justin Michael and people in his, they're using um, multiple pronged approaches uh, in a very short space of time. So they're using th triples, three forms of prospecting outreach within a 90 second period. And they're calculated, they're automated, they're structured. They're booking 10 meetings in a day, um, as opposed to maybe two meetings in a week. Now, this then raises the question, because I think there's another bit that's missing, which is that salespeople do not really, often do not really understand that sales is a subset of marketing. Mm -hmm. Anything that touches the customer is marketing. Yeah. Uh, sales is just you know, one component of that. And if I look at David Sandler, for example, at least two-thirds of his reading library was marketing books. And you know, we, we forget that marketing is absolutely essential and it has to be done well. But the problem is that most of it is anodyne and bland. And what you get is this marketing morphine outpouring from corporations and then salespeople are expected to share this drivel. Yeah. And then uh, they wonder why they've got you know, terrible response rates. You know, uh, on Google advertising, you have roughly 1.91% click-through rate. Facebook 1.61, one, 
and the stalker ads that follow you around, 0.03 open rates on emails are shoddy as shit. Uh, and the purchase rates on after they've opened are terrible too. Um, so all of this stuff just seems like a, w- a world of noise. So customers must be, certainly I feel it, because I get about 500 emails a day, most of which are unsolicited. <laughs> And it's interesting that, that, that the journey that I've been on in terms of becoming an, an independent is that I, back in the day, in my Michael Page days, would kind of joke, of, to, joke to marketing going, you're the colouring in department and you wouldn't have a job without the sales team generating the, you know, the, the revenue. Now, of course, that was back in the day when social, the social selling kind of marketing on social wasn't really a thing because social media did, didn't, it didn't exist. So I, if I reflect on it, the only reason most people took my call was they hadn't heard of Alexander Lowe, but they'd heard of Michael Page because actually marketing were doing a good job in terms of brand positioning of Michael Page as a well, I've heard of Michael Page as a company. So yeah, you're reputable. I'm going I'm to give you the extra 30 seconds to do your elevator pitch on the, on, on the phone. Fast forward to what I've had to, I've had to become a pretty average, <laughs> bad to average marketing person as an independent to start those conversations with people who've never heard of me to then go, okay, so you seem to know what you're talking about based on what I find and when you put you into, in, into Google, you, you appear. So that kind of starts to vaguely validate you as an individual. Now I'm going to give you some, um, uh, some more time. So I completely agree with you. It is this whole, you know, for me, it's my whole Volta Fatshe in terms of where sales fits within, within marketing. And also to your point about the, the anodyne, the amount of times you work with organizations and you challenge sales leaders, partners, lawyers, and you go, look, fundamentally, whether it's a Deloitte, a PwC, an a or a Clifford Chance or a Microsoft or a Salesforce, they don't give a shit. You're all the same and fundamentally on paper do exactly the same thing. So why is it you, the individual, that is instructed on that matter or instructed on that consulting gig or why is it you, the salesperson, that is bought for your, your CRM, your SaaS product, which to all intents and purposes is no different from everybody else there? It's you, the secret source, and back to our point around the human, that's, that's bringing something different. And we get this kind of pause and reflection, and I, I, I then flip it, and I go, okay, this is typically when I'm talking about per, personal brand, if I were to pick up the phone to 10 of your cu- your current kind of best customers, how would they describe to me what it is you or your product or service does for them? I guarantee you I'll get 10 different answers. That's what we need to start distilling. And that's what you need to start drawing out from a marketing perspective and the messaging. Actually start playing back how your current customers perceive you and describe what you do, not what you think you do for your customers. <laughs> your customers. This then starts to get into the really interesting stuff around, and I know there's debate in you know, the, the Justin Michael community and your chairman, one of the businesses as well, which debate around this intent data, psycho- psychographic data, and the really clever stuff that's out there to start to really help you almost jumpstart that conversation as to who your ideal customer you should be talking to at this point in time and picking up on your most recent podcast with Simon Severino, was it? Yeah. Around total addressable market, which I thought was just such a brilliantly simple way to think about it. Your TAM is not your TAM. It's your TAM for that week is how he described it. So website okay. visits, downloads, all that kind of data. But again, how many organizations have I talked to where they haven't even got to some vague sophistication of tracking that because marketing is still KPI'd in a way that the board want to hear about visibility, numbers, this and that. And back to my Jones Lang LaSalle days, they did um, uh, a video around, we designed our new um, office space. This is a service we provide for our clients. So we thought we'd do it ourselves. Brilliant. Did a thing on YouTube, 300,000 views on, on YouTube, highest ever viewed video in the commercial real estate sector on YouTube. Lots of Awesome, that's brilliant, it's worked. My first question was, where are the leads? And Martin went, oh, we weren't doing it for that. And I went, forgive my, la- forgive my language, but 300,000 views is a fucking waste of time then. Because if it's 300,000 irrelevant people, then yeah. it's not necessarily done what maybe it was meant to do, which is, yes, showcase what we're good at, but 
And? <laughs> Again, I think there's this enormously important debate, which I worry that too few organizations are having. Um, a, a key question is, why do we exist? Mm -hmm. We exist because of the customer. And I think that's definitely been forgotten because I think most organizations, particularly where they've been funded, think they exist because of the shareholder. Then we have the people within the business. And actually, if you look after them, they look after your customers. Mm -hmm. And you have control over how you look after them. You don't have control over whether customers buy or don't buy. You only have the control of what you can do to get them to that point. And they create these atrocious cultures, which encourage massive turnover of staff, mental ill health, churn of customers. Where is it economically sensible to lose nearly half of your customers every three years? Mm -hmm. And just to stand still, you have to replace them, which puts enormous strain and pressure on the sales function and the marketing function to produce leads and the metrics that are go, um, that are people are being measured by are lagging indicators or vanity metrics. Mm -hmm. They're not things that actually drive the business forward or drive the opportunity forward. But the senior management um, has reached that point where they're fat, dumb, and happy. I'm all three of those actually. So maybe I fit the bill, <laughs> but they lack the imagination. And so they don't see the reality of what impact all of this is having. Because if you have unhappy people, your share price growth is less than a third of those organizations with happy people. Mm -hmm. Profitability per employee is uh, less than a quarter of those with highly engaged staff. Revenue per employee is about half. Productivity is about 80%, and turnover is 40% higher in companies with mildly engaged and actively disengaged staff than those with highly engaged staff. So I think we really have to fuel this debate about what makes for a great business, what makes for great salespeople, great managers, great leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think we took a really bad wrong turn 40 years ago when Milton fucking Friedman came up with the concept that businesses exist to serve shareholder value. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's the, you know, if I go reflect back on my, um, my recruitment days, the, the two reasons, the two most common reasons were people leaving their sales roles, where they've been stiffed on commission packages. Still so happens. Stiff in terms of, I did what you told me to do. Now, all of a sudden, that means you've got to pay me more than potentially the CEO. Okay, but that's what we agreed. Or toxic cultures. And what's interesting, kind of fast-forwarding today around the, 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 social, the social selling aspect. I hate the term now. I think it's lost all, all meaning. Let's get real. Social selling is digital prospecting. Social selling is top of funnel starting um, conversations. Yes, it can be then used to nurture and, um, uh, and maintain, or it's used for referral selling. But that's still prospecting in terms of how you're using social to start a business conversation. Once that business conversation has started, then you need to move into your fundamentals of a good, a good sales process. But then working with sales leaders, sometimes the feedback I've got over the years has been... I don't want you to make a rock star kind of on social, if you will, of my sales team, because what if they become visible? What if they're, then, they're now more visible? What if they then leave? And I went, that's nothing to do with them being social humans on LinkedIn or whatever the platform, the platform is, because the only reason they'll be leaving is one or two things happening. And then that's a conversation you need to have, you know, have a reflection on either with your HR team in terms of the culture of the business or you're not coming good on your promises around what you're going to be paying from a revenue perspective. And if I reflect on, um, I did a, with the Association of Professional Sales, which is now, I think, morphed into the Institute of Sales Management. Again, a number of years ago, a senior leader from Oracle was there talking about how they try to incentivize their Oracle sales teams to sell smaller deals, revenue, but higher profitability 
and it didn't work because the sales team or the sales people or the sales person, whatever, the ones that sold the massive deals were always the ones that were celebrated, you know, by, you know, Larry and, and, and whomever, even if those deals weren't profitable. But because the number was like, you've just sold a million dollars or something, woohoo, without even thinking about how much does it cost us to get to that million dollars? And is that three year, five year contract actually going to make us any money? When they were trying to push the salespeople to sell stuff which they knew was profitable, but smaller and less sexy, dare I say it, because you had the people in lights going, you're, you're, what, this is what good looks like. What do we all do? We all gravitate to what the people we want to look like, right? <laughs> That whole piece around recognition is very important, but you, you've touched on that whole piece around personal brand. As a salesperson, I think unless you develop that strong personal brand, you will struggle to get a decent next role because the first place people look nowadays is LinkedIn, and you need to have created a position for yourself as someone who provides timely contextually relevant, valuable insight and content. And I kind of slipped into it by accident. And I'm good at cold calling, hate it. And I found that two things worked really well for me. One was social and the other was referral. And net result of that is I get between three and 12 inbound inquiries a week. As a solopreneur, well, my wife and I, that's actually more than adequate. So I spend most of my time turning stuff away and referring it on. And that, again, is another really powerful aspect, which is if you become a great referral source, you start developing an emotional bank account with a lot of people who want to help you. And that's been very powerful. So one of my daily habits is to refer, to give two good referrals by 12 o'clock every day. I'm not interested in the inbound. That's happening anyway but helping other people. And that's then led me into the whole piece around strategic alliances. It's not the channel per se. So that you know, they're not a channel partner. They're an ally where we naturally sell into the same target audience, but we don't compete. And what we do is complementary. And where we bring, where we come together, we offer massive incontrovertible value and competitive advantage. And I think a lot of salespeople are very selfish because we've learned to recruit self-starters, lone wolf, money-motivated, competitive, will-to-win sellers. But tell me this, as a buyer, do you like buying from those people? It's interesting in terms of the, and just reflecting just back on your earlier comments around HubSpot, you know, saying that social sellers outperform, you know, non-social sellers. LinkedIn talk about the same. Pinch of salt with that, as with all, all these, because if you kind of d- delve into the small print, it's social as part of their wider good sales process, which involves probably cold calling, email marketing, and everything supported uh, um, around that. If you then bring in the, the social aspect, build that personal brand, bring in value, become known, then yes, a- absolutely. And in terms of kind of the, the the selfish the selfish salesperson, well, that's just because how we've that's just the nature of the beast in terms of what this industry has has, has created. And I've worked across multiple industries. Internal referral schemes just don't work, <laughs> even if you incentivize people with money. It just doesn't uh, it doesn't work because it's either I can't be asked, I haven't got time, or the system's just so shit I can't even find who the person is that I need to to, to work with. Or back to your earlier point around CRM data, I tried this once. That contact was out of date. I wasted 10 minutes of my life trying to get to that referral. And it's just not, it just hasn't worked. Therefore, I'm not going to do it again, which then comes full circle back to people incentivizing, you know, how how we need to change all of this and maybe think differently about, and again, the customer first. I mean, Christ, I was taught that 20 years ago at Michael Page. You know, when I managed big accounts, like I earned my stripes to get to manage the likes of accounts of BT and IBM. I remember this one uh, one division of BT. Well, firstly, I had to put I put in the CRM system because we lived and died by it. Didn't get paid if you didn't put it in there. BT house account do not prospect. Are you do not fly in speculative CVs because that's just we've agreed to this in terms of our SLA. Time and time again, I get a call from an HRD going, "What the fuck are your team doing? You know we shouldn't be doing this." So reading the right act, have you read 
the rules of engagement. There's this one division, BT Retail as was, it's HRD, senior lady, and we were always told, even if the sales director approached us, tell them, have you done your six week internal recruitment process before going external? Because if you haven't, I can't work with you. Even if the sales director tells you, I can't be asked, I haven't got the candidates, you have to do that. This one HRD said, call me once a quarter. That's all I want to hear from you, once a quarter. So I religiously did it for a year and a half, got nothing. All my management going, what's going on? You're not growing this aspect of BT. I said, I'm just doing what I've been told by the, by the buyer, right? Out of the blue, she then emails me going, right, we're building an, entire, an entirely new division. I want paid in the Telegraph and the Times across the UK. And I single-handedly want you to run this campaign for, my, for Michael Page, which meant I had to go internally to break the rules because how it was is that each consultant individually in their territories would, would run it. And so I agreed with, with, with management. Everything would funnel up through me in terms of being the, the single point of recruitment. And I broke the record for a single quarter in terms of revenue. I think it did 175 grand against a 50 grand target. And for um, an amazing uh, 10 weeks, I was uh, numero uno on the sales leaderboard um, UK for Michael Page, where normally it was interim, they're always at the top because of piece of business to interim um, recruitment. But the fascinating thing is the minute I was no longer number one, management weren't interested. So back to how <laughs> you were being treated. The minute that it was no longer, oh, there's Alex from Michael Page sales at number one, it's back to the, <laughs> back to the day job, you're only as good as your, um, uh, your deal. But the reason I cite that, and to your point, Mark, is about buying, I did what the buyer told me to do. I followed their instructions to the hilt, and then that's what's happened. And Seth Mars, if you're not, if your listeners aren't following Seth Mars from Forrester, highly recommend you do because he's crafting some really interesting research around what they're referring to as dynamic guided selling, which is sales and marketing need to come together as one. Sales and marketing data have to now work together so that, you know, to your point, Marcus, stop working on historical data, start going to where the buyers are rather than where they have been. And they did a search, was released February, March of this year. 60% of the respondents said they can now, this is focused on SaaS, SaaS and technical buyers of products and services. 60% or so of their respondents said they could shortlist purely on digital content alone. So they don't even need to talk to a salesperson. If you believe the Gartner research out there saying that now for the millennial buyer, if you, uh, if you will, one of three don't want to talk to a salesperson at all. Yeah. Now, that's not saying I don't want to talk to a human being in the sales process. I just don't want to be sold to. So this whole dynamic is actually the buyer, and this has been talked about for years, is now really starting to force the change. So organizations need to get their head around this, which fundamentally is go and talk to your customers, have a human conversation with them, then start to look at how can technology support and augment the human in all of this to give your buyer a better overall experience because we are moving into the experience economy. If you look at all the what consulting firms are talking about, and every organization has been given leeway over the last 15 months or so in terms of this virtual world we now find ourselves in. But now, these kind of Zoom environments, these hybrid environments we're going to have to move into, the organizations that start to nail that experience digitally will start to win and win big. And what I mean by that is, back to your point around marketing leads sales, every time prospect customer touches an organization, digital, physical, they, they, they are feeling, experiencing something. So I bank with NatWest. <laughs> bank can't be asked to change. Would hate going into the retail environment, the physical store of, of NatWest, because the experience sucked. I just knew it was going to be horrible. The banking app, the digital app is bloody good, actually. It's really, really good experience in terms of how it works and how you can uh, personalize it to, to yourself. I also pay too much money for a platinum Amex card on an annual basis. The Amex experience digitally is shit. <laughs> yes, yeah, my expectation is that's costing me close to a thousand pounds a year to pay for this card. NatWest isn't, but the NatWest experience is, is better. So NatWest has now set that bench for me as a consumer, as a customer of what that experience should be. We will start to see this in the digital world. So if I'm following you, PwC, I used to work there. 
fascinating how they are now investing heavily in AR and VR to start to give their clients and graduates and onboarding a very different experience. And if they nail that, suddenly everybody else is going to have to catch up with them because they go, well, hang on a second. If PwC can do this, why can't you do it? Or if Microsoft can do this, why can't Salesforce do this? And that's, I think we're in a, it's going to be exciting. The digital gossip is really important. And I think people underestimate it. And we are social creatures and we will work on the basis of recommendations. And so social proof is really important. Gathering testimonials is really key. I've won at least 12 pieces of business because of the testimonials on my LinkedIn profile. And there's an app that's being developed by Chris Williamson called Askem. So he's from Yorkshire. What it is, is an app that you send a link before you visit a prospect and they then rate your performance as a salesperson. And that score follows you around whichever jobs. Now, that's going to be really interesting because the, the good will rise to the top. Yeah. And if you have an average or poor ask them score, you won't be putting it on your CV. And then that will raise the question, why not? But flip that then. If you're not getting a good score, I would then hope that leadership would try and help and coach that person to go, okay, w- what can we do to help you rather than, oh, your shit, we'll fire you and we'll just bring another person in to, you know, in to fill those and to fill those shoes, because SDRs, AE salespeople, your your cannon fodder, your ten a penny. But Alex, this then speaks to another fundamentally flawed problem with leadership, investors, leadership, and management, which is how they measure success and how they are incentivized, and how they then filter the, you know their behaviour. Uh, filters into the culture of the organization. Mm-hmm. And they then create the conditions where salespeople are forced to behave transactionally. You spoke to something uh, really important with your Michael Page example with BT. You need to maintain the conversation during the fallow times. Yep. Your content needs to consistently deliver value. I, I take issue with one thing that you said, which is I think Social is incredibly powerful for helping you to nurture and advance the middle and the bottom of the funnel as well. So when I uh, engage with a prospect, I will produce relevant content and tag them uh, to continue the conversation online uh, where it's asynchronous. Mm -hmm. Um, So they can look at that stuff whenever they feel the urge. And that moves the conversation forward because it uh, speaks to a particular aspect of their pain uh, or the better future that they're trying to achieve. And I think far, far too often, the management and leadership is pushing activity over meaningful action, pushing the transaction over the relationship, Mm -hmm. and they're pushing the commission over the customer. And that's all us about face. If we do not, as a profession, learn to appreciate that if you are on the receiving end of one of our touches and it makes your skin crawl and you want to wash afterwards, (laughs) then all you're going to end up with is a lot of ghosting. You're going to have this fictional pipeline. You're going to spend 80% of your time as a seller chasing people you should have closed or disqualified on the last call. Mm -hmm. And 88% of meetings on average, first meetings on average, do not result in a second. And if salespeople use psychographics in order to be able to rank a prospect list in terms of those most likely to engage today, they invested time in research, planning, and rehearsal. And I refer to a great example of this, Bill Bain. And before Bill Bain and uh, Bain & Co. would approach a customer uh, for the first time, they would put in at least 100 hours of research. And they would identify 40, 50, 60 different areas that they could help. And their opening message was, Alex, we've identified 67 ways that we can help you improve your business recognize that you don't have the time, money, or resource to cover all 67. Let's have a 20-minute chat. 
to identify the dozen or so that you can. And that's how they built their business. And you've got to put in the time. I've interviewed dozens of CXOs. And without exception, when you ask them, what was the best buying experience you've ever had dealing with a salesperson? Every single time. They came in. They'd obviously done their research. They challenged my thinking. They helped me gain insight, which was valuable to me. And I knew that I had to invite them back. And when the, I invited them back, they were equally prepared. They managed my expectations all the way through. And at the end, I got a better outcome than the one I was originally expecting. And often, I didn't even need, realize I needed their help. Yeah. Now, sorry, go on. No, no, I agree with you. And to, and to your point around, um, I get a bit ranty on, on social and digital, and I agree with you, absolutely 100% is, is, is great for nurturing. It's my frustrations with it is you see too many people trying to sell over social, and that's where the kind of the, 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 the disconnect is. So, of, of course, those digital touch points are, are critical through maintaining when you're not, you're not, you're not in the room. But if we reflect back on what you just said around that buyer experience, there's an adage out there that people shouldn't feel they've been sold to. <laughs> people no, buy. People hate to be sold. They love to buy. Ex exactly, and that's um, there's a brilliant book uh, called Getting Naked by Marcus Ciccone. I'll, I'll share the link with the author. It's, Pat, it's Patrick Lencioni. Patrick Lencioni. Thank you. Again, a great read around how the fable of these two consulting firms and the one that basically went straight in, straight in and consulted straight out the gate rather than, you know, going in and doing the hard, the kind of like the hard pitch. And it's just like, it's fascinating. That's kind of how, you know, my style, my style of approach is going in. I've got sales navigators so I can look straight. I can already identify the problem that none of your salespeople are on social because I can see that. So here's some data in terms of uh, backing, you know, backing that up. And here's some data that if you do this, this, and this, and this, would that be helpful? Yes. Cool. Well, let's just rock and roll and see, see how that, you know, see how that, that goes. But Again, that's it, it comes back to you know touching on your point around the very first question that proved to me any, any of this works is that I don't want my sales team messing around on social. I don't see the value. If they're messing around on social, then they're not doing the dials <laughs> or they're not doing the emails or they're not doing the sales thing that I did 20 years ago, which was pre-social, which is what which was all you could do. Let, let me just intervene at this point to back up your point. On average today, and this is based on 40 million cold calls a year, the average dial to effective rate is 33 to 1, unless you're calling senior executives in IT, in which case it's 46 to 1. Effectives to first meeting is 14 to 1. So you get through to another human being and you're only relevant one in 14 times. And then this is the most depressing statistic, 88% of first meetings do not result in a second. Now, you've just spent a fortune acquiring leads, mm -hmm. having marketing go through and qualify them to marketing qualified lead standard. Then to get them to a sales qualified lead, you're talking about 350 dials. You get them to first meeting and you blow it seven out of eight times, which means that on average, you have a 0.03% effective dial to advancement efficiency. That's 3,240 dials. Now, just think about that. Mm -hmm. As a sales leader or a sales manager, you're asking your salespeople to make three, three and a quarter thousand dials to get an opportunity to second stage. Even if your numbers are one in five, one in five, one in two, it's a hideously inefficient mm -hmm. process. And if you're not putting in the research, if you're not prioritizing to speak to those people who are open to a sales conversation, and instead you're speaking to people who are either making space for a problem or learning how, where they want to remain anonymous. All of that is dead time. Yeah. And pre-COVID, the average salesperson was 25 to 35% productive in any given working day. So three quarters to two thirds of your salary bill is wasted on unproductive activity. 
surely the question going through any sane manager or leader's mind is what can I do to help them be more productive? Why would I not adopt these technologies? Why would I not want them to be effective on social media? Yeah. Why would I not want them to develop a systematic approach to referral? Why would I not want them to work with strategic alliance partners who are already engaged with people we want to sell to? So instead of going from us to a cold prospect, we're going from us through a partner to a hot prospect, where the conversion rate is at least three times higher. Because at the end of the day, I want to go to the bank. And I want to keep going to the bank. Um, so why would I not then go back to my existing customers? And I see this all the time. We want hunters. Well, I want a hunter with a plow. I want someone who will sell through the idea of pods. is brilliant. But again, I think compensation needs to be addressed, where you make some money for winning the logo and getting the initial transaction. But a lot of tech companies have built their model on consumption. So why not have consumption targets, yeah. uh, adoption targets? Heaven forbid that we actually deliver the result the customer wants. That's when I think you should have a really big payout. And I think on the third renewal, you should have a really big payout as well. I think that should be celebrated because the customer has come back and they've come back again and again. Tell me this, because we're coming to the top of the hour. If you were to advise somebody who was new to a management role and their team was not heavily involved in social in any way, shape or form, what would be the roadmap that you would prescribe to get them started? You need to kind of uh, just kind of re forget everything you, you think about social. And my first port of call will be go and talk to customers, go and understand what they do and how do they consume social? What social channels are they on? B2B primarily, it's going to be LinkedIn and Twitter. You might get some surprises in terms of Facebook, Instagram, even TikTok. It's crazy with the sort of B2B shift I'm starting to see in there, more from a recruitment perspective. And then it's around understanding outcomes. So what, what is the big plan? What are you trying to achieve in terms of where do you want to go? And then it's working back through that. And then it's understanding where, where, where is social relevant to this, this point. And then it's like pipeline. If we were able to add X onto your pipeline, would that be a good thing to do? And the way that I do, do this with this calculation, let's say you have 10 salespeople. And they are each able to generate one more warm inbound lead through social over a 12-month a period. You're, just call it £10,000. Your average contract value is £10,000. 10 by 10 is an extra £100,000 worth of pipeline on top of your existing pipeline uh, activity. Now, if they did that once a quarter, now if they did that once a month, that's when people start to go, okay. Then I go, okay, let's look at your entire employee base. How many employees do you have on um, LinkedIn? 100, 500. Okay, every single person in this company has a connection to somebody at a company. So if we were able to activate that referral network and each employee were able to generate one unique referral over a 12-month period, now let's do 500 times 10 grand in terms of pipeline worth of you know, warm um, uh, opportunity. That's usually when they start to go, hmm, hadn't necessarily thought about it from that, that perspective. And then it's the, then two things need to run in parallel. Then it's the behavior change required to get you, the leader, and the sales team to start thinking more socially. Permission needs to be had. So that typically then we absolutely need to bring in marketing. We probably need to bring in, in brand. Because this isn't about broadcasting corporate. This is about broadcasting the. This is about bringing the individual to life. To your earlier point about the bringing, the bringing uh, value piece. This takes time. You might get lucky in a twenty-four hour period, and I have customers that have done that. It might take you a couple of um, uh, a couple of uh, a couple of months, and then it's starting to over time work out. This won't be for everybody, and nor should it be. But you'll have a small proportion in your team who are probably brilliant content creators and 
should be allowed to flourish around that. And the person that springs to mind you know, in the UK is Tom Boston from Salesloft in terms of the journey that he's taken as an, as an SDR through his ability to leverage content, leverage kind of the humor of, of sales, has become a, become a lead generation in, you know, engine just by himself to the point. He still prospects, he still does outbound, but here's the point, when he does it, people have already heard of him. They already know who, who he is and, and sales lot are. Then it's the, back to our earlier point in the conversation, your, your CRM process. How are you recording this? How are you recording that that action led to that thing? That team link introduction through Sales Navigator did this. That person wrote a blog post. That generated that, that conversation. Because if you're then not starting to re- record how all this conversation was originated, then unfortunately you can't prove that any of this works. But, but you just... can't replicate it either. Because no. if identified not only which medium generated it yep. but you've got documentation to be able to then copy it exactly. or replicate it then you can't scale and right. what flabbergasts me is the amount of wasted energy that seems to be acceptable i'm pretty rude and scathing about most marketing because it is dull bland anodyne it's technical gobbledygook certainly in the tech space you look at their websites and you read them and you think, unless I'm an engineer, I won't understand half of this. And why would I give a damn, uh, even if I was an engineer? And then you think about the way they market through and to and for their channel. That's appalling. Then you've got all these people in sales using that bland, dull, anodyne stuff in order to develop their talk tracks and attempt to create conversations. That's why those things, uh, those numbers that I quoted earlier are so poor. I know people who will uh, spend 20 minutes a day on the phone and book three meetings. They don't need more than three meetings, uh, three meetings a day booked. In fact, that puts them at such a stretch that they can hardly cope. Tell me this, you've got a golden ticket and you can fly back in time and advise the idiot Alex, age 23, what one choice bit of advice would you give him that you know he would have probably ignored? I, I doubled down on LinkedIn way back, way back when versus using it as a recruitment tool. I think that I'd be in a different place, uh, a different place now. But I think in terms of something that's useful, is always look forward and don't look back. And it's certainly in sales is hard. And sometimes in life, if it isn't for you, that's okay. And I've had this, you know, with in my Michael Page days, there were some recruitment consultants who were bloody nice people. They just weren't good salespeople. It just wasn't mean they're bad at sales. Go and find something that you are passionate about. I think what's interesting today for, for sales is that you now have the ability to be the master of your own destiny because back 20 plus years ago, we didn't have <laughs> what we had have now today is this access to knowledge and in, in information and everything that can be you know can be done there so you see the likes of the sales drivens appearing up you see the likes of what rob's doing at white you know white rabbit kind of popping up all these kind of fascinating things and yeah so it's keep on trucking really and just keep keep looking forward it's never personal if someone hangs up on you you don't know what's back to the human point you don't know what What's happened to that person in the day? They could have had a row with their wife. They could have had a you know, tax bill come through. They could have had all, all, sorts, all sorts of things. It's never, it's never you 99% of the, of the time. And long answer, one thing I did learn the hard way is manage up. The skill of managing up in terms of if something's, about, if something's going wrong and you can't fix it, deal with it then and go to management and go, I fucked up. And I think this is going to happen. Can you help? Because I tried to do something myself in terms of avoid the conversation, which would have meant I wouldn't hit my target. Then it all came out in the, in, in the open anyway. And it just, <laughs> it wasn't a good experience for me, my, me and my managers. So the art of managing up, if you see something's happening and it's going to go sideways, nip it in the bud then, because it's much better to have that conversation now than it is a week, two weeks, three months down the line when it's far, far worse. Definitely. Don't be afraid of confrontation. Deal yeah. with it. Okay, so what content would you suggest people pay attention to? Books, audios, podcasts? 
Yeah, so um, podcast, mine, obviously, Death of a Salesman. What other ones I listen to? So my first millions actually is brilliant, which is Shan Puri and oh the other chap who name always gave me. They set up the hustle, which has just been sold to HubSpot, and it's brilliant. They get some really fascinating you know leaders in terms of across all industries and how they made their first uh, their first millions. I've got a brilliant Facebook group which I'm a part of. Loads of kind of entrepreneurial people in there, just lots of ideas kind of to um, to kick around. So my first millions or MFM on all on all channels. Uh, in terms of books, uh, Eric Siegel, um, Predictive Analytics, is a brilliant, brilliant read. We've touched on uh, Getting Naked by Patrick uh, Ciccone. Is a, brilliant, a brilliant read in terms of that. And read books that aren't in your industry. Look outside of your industry and try and learn from what other people are doing. And the other thing, this is such an easy hack for salespeople, Go, you know, you mentioned Bain Markers, go to the big management consulting firms, go and find the partners that are the experts on the business challenges faced by the industry you sell into. You have free content and you have free ideas in terms of, I know that your industry is facing this. Research from CFOs from Bain McKinsey say this. Do you agree? And then tie that into how does your product and service solve that business challenge, which, been, which has been talked about these, uh, the, the management consultants. You touched on something that's desperately deficient in salespeople and in sales training, which is the whole piece around business acumen. If you don't understand the implications, the jobs that they're trying to get done, their struggling moments, then you have no business picking up the phone or emailing or inflicting your crappy content on them you've got to put it into the context in which your customers live and breathe. And it's all out there. It's all, on, it's all out there. <laughs> it's going to the ventures, the PwCs, the Baines, the Kinsey. It's all there. <laughs> Excellent. Alex, how can people get hold of you? They can find me on LinkedIn, um, Alexander Lowe, Twitter, at Alexander underscore Lowe, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I'm ashamed to say, but LinkedIn is the, probably the best place to start. But of course, mention this podcast if you've uh, listened to it. I'm always happy to talk. Fabulous. Thank you, Alexander Lowe. My pleasure, Marcus. Thank you. Excellent. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful, insightful, then please like, comment, and share it and tag someone who would benefit from listening to it. And do subscribe. If you feel the urge, go to Apple or Google Podcasts and give an honest review. I'd be very grateful. Now, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, Marcus at last-last.com. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.